I'm Ardra Shepard, and this is Tripping On Air, a place to talk shit about what it's like to have MS. Normally, I like to make everything about me, but MS also affects the people we love. So weighing in from the partner perspective is Alex Hajar, my friend whose wife also has MS. Join us monthly as we dish about everything from symptoms to stigma. If you have MS or you love someone who does, we want to connect with you. Happy New Year, Trippers. It's 2023. Our guest today is an author, speaker, host, and comedian. He's the highlight of my social media feed. He's a self-described optimist adventurer who happens to have cerebral palsy, the sexiest of the palsies. Trippers, we've got the one and only Zach Anner on the show. Zach, welcome to the show and Happy New Year. Oh, thank you. Happy New Year to you. I'm so glad that you are able to, you know, like even function in the first few days of the new year. Like, how are we, how are we feeling? Is it, are we, are we feel, did, we, did we party too hard? Did we eat too much? What's going on? I mean, I feel like just every normal day for me is... Uh, it is is too much. I ate too much. Every day is a party. Late. Every day is a party. It should be, That's though. right. I think yeah. it's well deserved. Totally. Yeah. yeah. But I would, so New Year's is a time for resolutions. And when we think about this time of year, a lot of times we're thinking about what we want to fix about ourselves. And for people with chronic illness, in my case, MS, I feel like there's this constant pressure to try to fix MS through diet or exercise or whatever, and it is not that easy. We are told to fight MS, and I feel like that can put us in a battle against ourselves, which is, of course, totally gross. Zach, this time last year, you launched your 2022 Like Yourself Challenge, where you encouraged people to think about one thing every day that they already liked about themselves, and I loved this. Even if the challenge didn't quite make it to the end of the year, which... Oh, my God. It <laughs> fell off completely after, like, four months, right? But I also loved that because three cheers for being able to say fuck it when something is too much. Do you think it's particularly important for people with disabilities to embrace this kind of self-love? Like, what motivated you to, to at least start this challenge, even if you didn't finish it last year? Well, here's the deal. And I'll explain how it fell off a cliff and why I started it in the beginning. Like, I think, I think that self-love is wonderful and important, but I feel like you have to remind yourself that you also are somebody that you want to hang around with and, and like that you are actively liking yourself. And like, cause love is something deep. You can, uh, love is something really deep that you like, oh, even when I'm unhappy with myself, I still can love myself, which is great and important. But I wanted to start this challenge just to remind people like, hey, there's a lot that's already great about you, even the little things that you need to be cheering yourself on about. Like, and it's, it was not even like, oh, there's something that needs to change. There's like, Things that are already in place that make you great. And if you want to make a change, then uh, like actually thinking, oh, I'm somebody that's cool and deserving of, of this work is a great place to start. I mean, I love that. So, you, and were you thinking of this sort of just in general or because I do feel like there is this kind of pressure for people with disabilities to to try and fix themselves. I don't know if that happens in the cerebral palsy community, but with MS for sure, it's, you know, there's this idea of, um, you know, being a warrior or a fighter and, and, and always trying to take this responsibility to kind of fix yourself. And uh, I think, you know, that can put you in a battle with yourself, which doesn't feel so great. Yeah, I think, it, I, I think it's important to admit when things suck and when things are difficult. And I think there is such a thing as, as like uh, sometimes in the, the disability community, I feel like that becomes the narrative because that's what people without disabilities want to see as like, oh, look, this person has uh, a, a condition 
I don't have, and look what they're making of it. Like, I feel like that's almost for the benefit uh, of the able-bodied community sometimes. And that's sort of, we internalize that of like, we need to fight through and inspire somehow. And I just, I don't buy into that. I mean, I, I totally relate to that on so many levels. I think everybody who has a disability, who has a book or a podcast or a show, myself included, um, claims that they are funny. And in your case, you actually are funny, but can, but I mean, you're solid no, six. I, yeah, okay. Six and a half, maybe. No, you are solidly funny. But yeah. I, do you feel this pressure to be this kind of palatable, disabled person? Like, what? Uh, I used to. I really used to feel like I, I needed to, like, I needed to present, like, in order to make the world more accessible, I needed to present the most accessible version of myself to the world, right? And now I don't really like I I am a uh, generally pretty positive person, uh, but I used to feel like I that was the only side of myself that I could show, or else my audience or the people who followed me uh, wouldn't wouldn't like it. And now I, I don't really feel that because I feel like what they really were responding to is like. This is who we see as a genuine guy. So even if I am being positive, I always try and tamper it with something just a little bit negative. Uh, I'd say, you know, like uh, the the uh, you're you're seeing this positive minute and a half or three minute video of me, but just know that's that's because the that's the minute I'm choosing to show you because that's the question that I get so often from from commenters is how do you stay so positive and it's just and my answer is always because i'm not filming the <laughs> negative stuff yeah that's yeah. how yeah i'm only positive for about three minutes a day as well that's about as much yeah, as i can muster. that's that's about the right <laughs> amount and then the the weight of the world catches up with you they, but yeah. you can still enjoy like you can enjoy a nice milkshake now and then and be like this is great yeah and just distract yourself a little bit. So I've got a question. Uh, is anyone making resolutions anymore? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I've made one since 2020. So. I hope not. <laughs> because I, like, honestly, I, I know that it's, it's 2023, but I might just pick up the like yourself challenge again and just keep going. Like, that's the thing. I feel like we set ourselves up of like, like we we're always like oh it's got to be in this frame of time and then the the question that i have is why like why why if we start something and fall off is that like the end of the world are we why are we falling off the edge of mount doom if we let something go and like that's that's the thing that i've realized is you can pick up anything at any time and just progress is progress. It doesn't have to be based in the calendar year. I know that the Canadian calendar is different anyway. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Right? I think the, we were what, like one, one week behind you or something like that. Yeah. 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 And I, I, you guys have like that 400 right. day calendar year, right? So I want to make a case for resolutions. I, uh, I agree with you, Zach. Like I'm the kind of person that makes changes and and tries to do new things. I don't wait necessarily for a milestone to do those things. The tiny case I will say for setting resolutions, even if we know like 99.9% .9 of people fail, is because I think it's worthwhile to take stock every now and then. To, and even if you don't follow through on what you say you're going to do, it's it gives you a chance to identify at least kind of what you want in life or or changes that you want to make or or what's good in your life or I don't know. I'm just, I, I also. Do you have like an example of like when it's actually like been a tangible difference in your life to, to start a resolution and has it felt good? Has there been a year that's felt like, oh man, really, really nailed it. Honestly, like I'm a little bit of an overachiever. Like I, I, 
I can you tell know, that. No, I can thanks. tell that just because you have you have books behind. I you. do have books, but I mean, I speak four languages. Like I, I, enga- yeah, I no, I just like I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always setting these kind of goals, so I don't necessarily wait for New Year's. But I think it's like, and I bet that you achieve a lot of them. I do. Yeah, I do. So what what would be what would be your recommendation to people like me? who sets a lot of these goals and then just gets so distracted. I mean, are you like, are you distracted by things you enjoy? Like, are you happy with those distractions? Well, I don't, I'm like, I have the memory of like a fruit fly. I think it's, uh, there's a lot of um, ADD energy coming from me. Um, But I think what, what happens what happened with the like yourself challenge if i'm being honest is like uh about four months in there was a lot of uh like personal uh uh, i wouldn't call it like tragedy but drama going on with family stuff and then the world sort of fell apart with different wars and things and then you're like um is it really useful for me to go on and say, I like that my, like, I like that, that I can go and get a haircut and just accept a bad haircut. Is that worthwhile when the world is falling apart? And that's my, my struggle I mean, is, is to always think is the small thing, is the small thing disrespectful to the larger picture? I think, th- right? yeah, well, I, that's like a responsibility of, of somebody who has an audience and a platform, right? So I think it's really thoughtful of you to consider those things, but I definitely would argue that there is a place for those kinds of moments of joy, especially on the internet. Yeah, I I just feel like if there's any corner of joy you can carve out of the internet, that's that's a goal. Um, Totally. But I think like when I get distracted, to answer your original question, I, I... I am somebody who chases uh, momentary happiness in at sometimes at the expense of long term joy. Well, I think that's m- most of us, right? Like that instant gratification. So, where did you learn your 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 long hip like long haul skills from to just do stuff, or is that innately in you? I think it's just in me. I'm just like one of those. I just do what I say I'm going to do. But I mean, come on, Zach, you're pretty accomplished yourself, right? Like, I, yeah. I, I, just, I, maybe it's a Canadian thing. It's not. Maybe I was, it's not. It's not I a Canadian thing. I promised as an American I, that everything would be easy. We, we, and when it isn't, we were, we sometimes never, I bail. We were never allowed to have video games when I was a kid. And now that's my go-to distraction. So if I've got a goal, I'm like, I'm definitely going to learn these songs and guitar. And, uh, and then my brain will immediately switch to, I need to beat that level first. And then I'll get into that. I mean, that's a goal, Alex. Um, so, <laughs> so your, your homework, the thing that, that is like the thing that you have to do that's so hard is learn songs on guitar. I have to play them live sometimes too for other people. But that so. should be the, isn't that the passion? Isn't that the fun thing? It is, but it's the procrastination that gets in the way, right? Like that's what I'm saying. It's fruit fly memory, right? So it's yeah. akin to fruit fly memory where it's like, I need to play this no, song, which I enjoy like squirrel, doing. But right? I also want to beat like, this level and put yeah. that off. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Squirrel. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think, you know, Zach, we've kind of established that you're an optimistic dude, but with that in mind, um, has there been an impact on your sense of optimism over the last couple of years, you know, with all the existential dread that's happening? I think, uh, well, I lived in Buffalo, New York, moved back with my family, uh, in Buffalo, New York for two and a half years, just moved out back out to Los Angeles last week. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, I mean, moving back into your childhood bedroom as a 36 year old man or when, when the pandemic started and then like getting back here at like 30, no, I was 35, I think when it started. And, and now I'm 38. So, um, 
So it's just like um, that was that was a little t- blow to my self esteem because there were there were things that I had built up as being important to me specifically as someone with a disability because I think when we, when you have a disability it's sort of drilled into you and in in a not always helpful way that like independence is the most important thing. And what the pandemic taught me or or, uh, sort of reinforced was that um, independence in itself is overrated and we all rely on other people to make things happen. And I hope that the whole world sort of got that picture a little bit because, you know, when I was moved back in, in March of, of 2020, like the whole thing was like, I'm somebody whose independence is actually like, I'm really dependent on, on food delivery services and, and housekeeping services and, and Uber drivers that like, were not, like safe during the pandemic. So it just made me really appreciate the support system that I have. And also it made me appreciate the time that I had with my family and take a step back and like not be so goal oriented and be like, like my, my parents are getting older, you know, how, how much more time quality time do I have with them and maybe take this as as a gift and not try and measure like what my accomplishments are and like directly tie that to my happiness Um, or your sense of self-worth right I think it's we as a society it's we value independence so much so that we almost stigmatize needing assistance in the other direction. And it's so hard to find the, the grace of being able to accept help. And, uh, I mean, I've struggled with this also. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, that's a, a, that sounds like you were on a real journey throughout that. I mean, I feel like just if I had to move back with my parents, I would immediately regress to my teenage self, which oh, and that happened would not be too. fun for anyone. That happened too. That was always like, I didn't do laundry once. And, uh, <laughs> and it was like played a, a thousand games of Yahtzee. Uh, and now that it's, that I've been through it, wouldn't trade it for anything, just being able to have so much time with family. But like, just being in this new apartment now and being able to do things like the dishes and and wash my own clothes, I take such um, like deep appreciation from that, that it's just like, oh, this is, this is great. I just get a lot of satisfaction out of doing those types of things now, but like, it's also with independence versus accepting help and interdependence and all that stuff. I've learned that the, the things, whether or not I, I like can do something is less important than like, how long is it going to take me to do it? Will it derail the rest of my life to, to like, well, like it would take me a day to put on a fitted sheet, for example. I've done it twice. <laughs> and it's very hard yeah. to do that when you're actually on the bed, right? right? Which is how I have to do it. And you're just like pulling corners and go running over to one corner, going over to the next one. And it just never works. But it's like if I can hire someone to do this and, and pay them and it can be an exchange and an appreciation, it's it's certain things are not worth it. Certain things are like, it's, it's worth it to me to ask for help because this allows me to do the things that I am genuinely good at that uh, like are me adding some value into the world. I think for me, it's a kind of a constant negotiation when, you know, it's one thing if uh, I'm paying for help, it's another thing when I'm trying to like do the math on, you know, how much is my discomfort worth 
like asking for my husband who has just sat down to get up and like get me that thing like the glass of water wine (laughs) that would take me like 10 minutes to like walk and get myself that I would drop and break and then he would have to clean up it's like you know always doing these uh calculations of like how irritating am I going to (laughs) be versus how uncomfortable am I I I think you know (sighs) I think we often undervalue as people with disabilities, like how much we add and how how much value we do have and how much uh, joy and meaning we put into the world. And we just always, it's always an equation of like, well, this person did this for me and I won't be able to do that for them. But most of the time, if you are acknowledging like, Like I just, what I've learned in like much too late is just to be more aware and have the gratitude and, and realize that I'm also bringing a lot to the table, which is like, I, I always like when I was younger, I, the only way that I could think to even try and level the playing field at all was like i used to like pay for everything for friends and like because i thought there's no way that i can like they're doing a lot for me physically and like i i feel like i need to have something to give and as soon as i started making money i was like oh that's it then um but uh i've learned that you know what i actually bring from my humanity is probably enough um but that's all you know i love that zach i feel like i feel the same like the way you're like you know uh these my helpers bring this to the table i bring this to the table i feel the same way except it's like uh i know i'm being annoying but you are also annoying yeah right like yeah it's like i can be annoying but it's not like my you know embracing that we're gonna be annoying (laughs) Uh, is it's right. part of uh, that's that's the the greatest we can you still can love each yourself. other like, like yeah stop like, trying just... to not be annoying you know like because i feel like anyway. I, have, I have talked myself into being more annoying because i always try and be like i don't need any help uh and and uh you know i talk in circles and then finally accept the help which is way more annoying than just saying, yeah, it would be better if you did it. It would be so much easier and, if you did it. I th- and how that, many, do you say sorry? sorry like, sorry, do you apologize, so much do you apologize you a lot? That has yeah. trickled. That seems to have trickled down uh, south of the border. Yeah, the sorry movie, is my, yeah. uh, like, I start every sentence with sorry. Like, I'm. I know. <laughs> it's gross. So Why you do are, I do that? You are an honorable I am so Canadian deeply then. apologetic for everything I've ever done <laughs> and everything I ever will do. Okay, well, maybe Alex can weigh in here because um, Alex's wife has MS. So Alex is in that uh, partner caring caregiver role. Yeah. I mean, whenever I'm asked to do a task, I, it's kind of just an automatic, I'm going to do it. Uh, there's no stop being annoying because you're not annoying to me. So I'm from the partner perspective, in my case, anyways, I don't think anybody who, uh, I don't think, I don't think Nicole's being it's annoying. It's never annoying. You know, you don't it's, like sometimes. I mean, like, I, I feel like sometimes I there's a, there's a pang. You get it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, you yeah. don't have to say it on <laughs> the, the podcast, but it's okay. That's the thing right. too. <laughs> full disclosure, it's, it's like, full I, disclosure, there's a pang. I suspect if people aren't annoyed with me a little <laughs> bit sometimes, and if it doesn't boil over sometimes, then I suspect they're secretly annoyed with me all the time. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So full disclosure, there are pangs of resentment once in a while, but generally what I I think I should have said, the overarching feeling is that I'm not annoyed. I'll get the hot water bottle or I'll get the coffee or I'll get whatever you need. Uh, But if I've like laid down on the bed about to like read, uh, you know, a really great book or something like that, then you mean play a video game. Let's be real, yeah. Alex. Or watch or watch TikTok or How something like that. How many books have you then, just uh, like bought so that you can hold them up on the podcast? They're they're it's from the library. Oh, it's from the library. the library. I love that it's but, from the library. See, right? Fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So I'm a library guy. Um, 
But yeah, so I mean, yeah, once in a while, I think there's kind of like, uh, I just wanted to sit down and watch TikTok. But I live in like a very, very small apartment. So walking the whatever three meters to the kitchen is not that big. Of yeah, a that's thing. the thing. I'm like, you, Maybe the bigger you the get house, the, wine, the more annoying I'll take it care of the brain damage, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think so. Well, I did show the book. So I did want kind of want to say like in your book, you do say in nearly every interaction with somebody uh, new, your first job is to undo all the misconceptions you have about people with disabilities. Even as a partner of someone with a disability, I feel like there are regularly misconceptions that I uh, myself, I have to correct. So like we were talking about, I think there's a tendency for people to underestimate Nicole, right? Underestimate the person with disabilities and overestimate me. Uh, like I said, I can be pretty lazy and procrastinating and I'll veg out and play video games for hours uh, if given the opportunity. Um, I just got my cat an auto feeder because they exist. And that's Do one of those things where I was doing the math. box too? I don't, I haven't got there yet. No. I, See, I feel like I haven't got there yet. Christmas, owners, Christmas? Like, like, cause I'm, like <laughs> it's my on my Amazon wish list. Cat house too like yeah there is a level of laziness of like i don't i will trade the love of a dog for just the easiness of a cat absolutely absolutely no way okay Nicole, nicole is uh she's actually superhuman so she does everything that she does and then she's also has to deal with ms but uh what we do like i was kind of saying the overarching thing is that this is kind of normal for us but heading into 2023 what is one let's say delusion about disability that you want to clear up heading into 2023 i think i think what what i would like to to just communicate about disability is that that, which is something that I've learned uh, way too late, is that the intersectionality of disability uh, and uh, other prejudices and other um, marginalizations, like the intersectionality of that, like really affects the disability experience. And I didn't understand that until way too late. Like I'm. I, I have a disability, but I'm still a white guy. So I get a lot of privileges that white guys get. And my disability experience has sort of been shaped by that. And if I were someone of a different race, that experience would be vastly different because I've never had to fear for my life or my health based on having cerebral palsy, right? So, and that's not the case with everybody. And, it, you know, I'm not the person to really speak to that in great detail because I only have my experience, but just knowing that like, oh, okay. I always thought of myself as somebody who, who understood what it was like to, to be marginalized, but there are so many different facets to that. And there are so many, um, benefits that I get that other people in the disability community don't get that it's just like I feel like we need to be talking about those things in a more nuanced way um and so I if there's one thing like how how it relates to me is just like knowing that like uh speaking up and knowing that when I get an opportunity being aware that you know it's not it's not a one-to-one -one of people with disabilities. And like, I think that was one of the, the things that if I could go back and like address uh, in, in the book, if I knew it then, it's like, uh, there's a lot of blanket statements in that book about what it's like to uh, live with a disability. And you living with a, a disability as a woman is different than me with a uh, as a man and there's still yeah. i i mean i acknowledge also that i have a lot of privilege as well um within my disability i think that that is one of the challenges for advocacy for the disability community in general is engaging that intersectionality and i think one of the problems is this reluctance to find any pride of identity in disability the way other marginalized communities sometimes can. 
And, um, and so I think that, you know, the work that you're doing, Zach, also is helpful um, in, in that space, because really, if we can just, we can't um, advocate for ourselves or any of the intersections of the disability community if we don't feel like we're worth it and, and that we, we deserve um, you know, accessible spaces and opportunities and income equality and all those kinds of things. Yeah, I think I think that's really important. And I think also like one of the things that that sort of blew my mind a little bit um, is that, you know, in the in my disability space, like disability pride is something that is talked about a lot. But for other marginalized groups, sometimes it's not safe for them to identify as disabled. So there are a lot of people with invisible disabilities or, or, you know, like disabilities that they don't feel comfortable talking about just because of the way that society treats them due to their like other marginalizations. And like one thing that uh, like I've sort of shifted my perspective on it is like, I used to think, oh, it's important to have accessible spaces so that I can be a part of things. And I've sort of shifted that into like, it's important for spaces to be accessible so that those spaces don't miss out on what I'm bringing. Like, it's not just for me, I love it's that. for everybody. Oh, I it's love for that, everybody. Zach. That's like my favorite thing you said. Um, it's yeah, for, like, I love so that. that you don't miss out on these amazing people who ha- have disabilities and what they're bringing. You're not doing them a favor. It's it's a community based thing, and you're making your community stronger by making your space. I spaces love accessible. that. I love that. Zach, you have such a way of making it feel like it's not one team against the other. And we are all learning and and you seem to have so much patience for that process. I mean, you even call yourself out in your book uh, when you talk about challenging uh, a kid with no limbs to prove that he needed the accessible Oof. parking. I mean, that's that's an extreme example. But I mean, so many people have been on both sides of a social situation where a disability is either being questioned or doubted and having to be defended. What advice do you have for, like, what, do you, what would you tell the self-appointed disability police or, you know, the people who've been asked to prove themselves? I, you know, I've definitely come around because I would say one of the, the, the biggest struggles as someone with it, like, disability, like honestly, the, the time when I feel the most disabled is when I'm going through an airport and there's somebody in the accessible stall who just like jogs out, and jaunts out, and like it makes me feel frustrated. And then I was doing a panel where I was talking about that. And then so, someone else on the panel called me out and they're like, there are a lot of invisible disabilities that people still need to use those stalls and you never know who's like dealing with what. And I, I was like, oh, damn, maybe I'm a little bit ableist. And I think I think that's the thing is like just because we are going through these experiences this doesn't mean that we don't have our own prejudices to deal with. And we should all always keep those in check. Like if there, like there's never a time where there's not more to learn and grow. And I think like like we we are so um like we're so quick to judge people who just don't know better and and i think there's an antagonization of of people who make mistakes and have a long way to go and they're learning about disability culture and i that's just not the way that i choose to deal with it because like i'm still learning i know it's complicated and the thing with disability that you spoke to earlier, like there's not necessarily the same cohesion in this community. Uh, There's not the same cohesion in this community as other communities because the experiences are so different in terms of uh, like the way that the world 
views us as individuals because every disability manifests itself differently with each person. And like, I can talk to another person who has CP and just because of how it, it like CP wears on them, it's, it's my life has been completely different. Right. And because of the way I was raised and my perspective and the things that I value, like the, the CP experience is not universal. So like the thing that we need to come together on is just how like unique it all is. And like the, the change in itself can be how, how the able-bodied community sort of like can interact and just take people as people. Right. Like, um, and just like giving people the benefit of the yeah, doubt, right? Like, just you don't, yeah, just you you wouldn't treat everyone says treat every person the same, but every interaction is different. Just treat a person like a person, right? And engage with a human being and not a condition, and and then you know learn as you go, because you can you can learn all the right things to say, and then like you'll you'll say whatever like you think is the correct phrase and like people would be like, don't call me a person with a dis disability. I'm a disabled. Like it's fine to say disabled. And like those things shift so quickly that just like meet people for who they are and go from there. Don't try and create a handbook on how the uh, every engagement should go because once People are adults, like just, just treat, treat people with humanity and they'll like reciprocate. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's maybe the ignorance has come from the, I guess maybe a little bit of the fact that like a lot of the world has already been built for one type of person or for a very few types of people rather than taking into I consideration mean, everybody who isn't, doesn't fit that mold. I think um, it's storytelling, right? I think it's media and the stories that we tell. And I think it's starting to change. Um, if you don't have, if you don't know somebody, multiple people with multiple different disabilities, then your experience of that experience is what you know from TV and movies. And I think we've fucked it up for a long time, but things are really changing. And Zach, you've worked in television and media for more than more than a decade, a long time. In 2011, when you were doing your show for Oprah's Network, you said that and you, you said it in this interview also, in order to make the world more accessible, I was going to have to present the most accessible version of myself. I also host a television show, Shameless Shout Out Fashion Dis. Uh, I can attest to the fact that the biggest challenge is managing your bathroom routine around shoot days. In 2011, it didn't feel safe for you to ask for accommodations, even with freaking Oprah. Um, I'm very proud to say that Canada is in the process of launching a disability screen office. What changes have you noticed in the industry since you first started out? And what advice do you have for someone in any industry that needs accommodations. Okay, well, I will actually like, and it, maybe it didn't come through in the in the book, but um, the Oprah Network actually, before I went on that reality show, like they were really very much in terms of uh, like making things uh, like accessible and accommodating my needs, they were on board. Like I met with a, uh, an accommodation specialist uh, beforehand and they asked me everything that I needed. And there were certain things that I needed that I was just too timid to ask for. So yeah, and, that and I guess that's, on, yeah, that's what me. I, but that's um, what I mean, right? Is like, you so, didn't feel safe because, you know, it's like you have to work that much harder to make it like, you know, it's, I would do yeah. you feel safer now because of who you are or because things are changing. Oh, absolutely. More? I you think, know? I think it's really changing now because it's at least part of the conversation to begin with. Like, it's not like the, the show that I uh, wrote for most recently uh, is a show called Best Foot Forward on Apple TV. And like, what was really 
incredible is it was about a kid with a limb difference. And it was like half the writer's room were people who identified as disabled. And which is like just a few years before when I was writing for Speechless, I was like the only uh, writer with a disability in the writer's room. Um, and the the changes that I've seen in terms of of the way that disability is incorporated, like at first it was like all about like, uh, at first it was just like getting representation on screen. Doesn't matter if the person is actually representative of the community and has the disability and just seeing those characters on screen were such a big deal to, to me growing up. Like, you know, I, I auditioned for Glee and it was terrible, but like the kid that wound up getting the part wasn't disabled, but just that the character existed was cool. And then like, I remember when I was a teenager, and this will not, so many people will not agree with me on this, but I saw the Tom Green movie, Freddy Got Fingered, and his love interest was in a wheelchair. It was not a, a, um, a person who was actually a, a wheelchair user, but I was just like so enamored that, that like that could be an option for a romantic lead to be using a wheelchair. And now it's more about like, let's get authentic re representation on screen. And the TV show um, that I was talking about, like they had uh, disabled directors and disabled crew members and the person who wrote the theme song also had a disability. And it was just like using the like entire show as, as like, oh, we can employ these badasses with disabilities and have it not just show up on screen, but behind the camera. And it, and it wasn't like, oh, we'll figure out how to do this when we're shooting. It was built into that show from the ground up because the production company, which is Canadian, by the way, it's Muse Entertainment. Um, they, they are like, so um, they have their, their like finger on the pulse of that. And that's really cool to see because that influences the types of stories that you can tell and it's authenticity from top to bottom. So it's cool. That's awesome. It's really exciting to see these changes. Absolutely. I kind of wanted to ask actually, um, so it's my, my wife, Nicole has uh, MS. And so um, I'm the partner, but uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the caregiver as well. But so throughout the book and, and uh, throughout, you know, watching that's, uh, that's awesome. And riding shotgun and workout Wednesdays is one of my favorite things. Uh, it's so great to watch. I love it. Um, you're surrounding yourself with a great team of, of friends that are also caregivers. Um, do you have a different dynamic with people that provide care that are your friends versus friends who don't? Um, how do you protect those relationships? And, um, and yeah, I mean, uh, what advice do you have for someone who's like a caregiver, but also a partner or a friend or a husband or wife or something? Uh, here's, and I don't know that I'm the person to speak to this, but like, like my group of friends, is, like I've never hired a caregiver in my life. It's always been friends and family and making this hodgepodge of, of incredible people who, who, understand like what my needs are and like that's part of the dynamic is like that we're going to be goofing around but sometimes i'll need help with certain things and like i've just been surrounded by great people who i've found because we've had like similar senses of humor and we've been making stuff and luckily they've all been down to to be helpful as needed and i think like just like the the level of appreciation that I have has only grown throughout the years, and I'm just like like understanding that that empowerment is a two way street. So when I have the opportunity to empower them through you know work or whatever, I I will do that. And like we we understand each other in terms of like oh. It's not exactly even, but we're, it's, we're both like everyone's giving what they can here. Um, and, and in terms of like romantic partners, I think like, like my experience was super 
limited as you guys probably read from the book. But what I learned is like, you have to have those boundaries. And like, I was learning, learning, uh, in my first relationship at age 29, like that, that a, like a romantic partner doesn't necessarily want to always be a caregiver at the same time. And you need to make space for that separation so that you can have like, like switch roles because they're not always entwined and like, like just communication, I think is the, the thing that I was the worst at, right? I, because I didn't know what was going on with my own body. So I couldn't communicate it to anyone else or what my own needs were because so much of my life, uh, the things that people were taking care of for me, I, I, I didn't see them. Like, because that, that idea of independence was so ingrained in me, like people would try to make the things that they were helping me with invisible so that I could feel all confident and like I was being independent. And then, um, it wasn't until I got into a romantic relationship where the person who I was with was like, Hey, um, like I'm actually doing a lot here and I'm, I'm wanting a partner and you're not really being a partner. You, you just seem to want like another mom. Uh, so I have is, to be like, how much yeah. of this is disability and how much of this is like, you're just being a guy? Little bit. I that's the thing is it's something that a lot of guys like it's not unique to this yeah it's not right? it's not just using it's not yeah. unique but the bubble that's created when you grow up with a disability is sometimes pretty thick right so it, I'm sure it's amplified right so I think a lot of that like I I heard from so many women after like they read the book like that Jillian's perspective of like oh that's I had to do all this with my husband and like because he wasn't like he didn't know how to be an adult man uh and it's not just you it's not just disability but some it's important like as somebody who who requires a lot of help to at least the level of awareness has definitely increased and that's made my life a whole lot better I, I do have one more question, but I wanted to see, I wanted to ask you something. What rates higher? Is it a verbal sort of apology or do you just take someone out to the Olive Garden for an apology? Oh, the Olive Garden? Uh, well, the Olive Garden, here's the thing. And I think I, I explained it in the book. The Olive Garden, probably not like the best food in the world, right? But it is, I think, the greatest restaurant for being like a complete clean slate of making it whatever you want it to be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I still hold the record of 17 breadsticks in one setting. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> That's and I feel pretty good about that. Still love the OG, but, um, it's yeah, like, an accomplishment. uh, I've moved, my palate has definitely, uh, grown since I've written the book. Um, but, uh, you know, the Olive Garden will always have a place in my heart. And are you, are you working on another book? What, what's next? You're in LA. What's, what are you up to? Where can people find you? Okay. Well, people can find me around Burbank, uh, California. Uh, I'll just be zooming around on the street. Um, uh, Jillian Grassi and I, who was my girl, ex-girlfriend, current writing partner, right? Um, we, we, um, I'm sure there's lots of material there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So we're pitching the show version of the book, which sort of charts our relationship. Um, and, um, we're also writing a movie that's going to start, uh, sh shooting, I guess in the summer sometime. And I'm not sure I'm supposed to talk about it. Oh, well, you but heard it here, like, folks. That's very exciting. We're excited about it. We're very excited. Um, but, yeah, I wish I could give you more details, but I can't, which means I have to come back on the podcast to hawk the movie. Whenever. I would love that. Yes. Zach, thank you so much for being on the show. This was amazing. I could talk to you all day.
Oh, thanks for having me. Sorry, I didn't make more jokes. You introduced me as this comedian, and then we get into this deep philosophical conversation. Of, but whatever, whatever, man. I mean, no, I love it. I, I mean, like, we got to talk about this stuff, right? Yeah. I think, yeah, I anyway, think it's so I important. Thought it was great. I, and, I loved uh, it. And can you explain to me what fashion this is? Because I just, my wardrobe needs. I can. Yep. <laughs> so Fashion Dis is a makeover series created and hosted by me. I'm also a writer. Um, and now this is just me bragging uh-huh, and being uh-huh. embarrassing. Fashion Dis, it's, <laughs> it's uh, a makeover s- show and it features people with disabilities. And it's really was created out of this sense that, um, you know, people with disabilities have been erased from the fashion and beauty industry. And I really wanted to highlight the style and beauty potential of people with disabilities to also add to the canon of high fashion images that are out there. I think representation is so important. There are also adaptive clothing brands uh, and, and beauty brands that are you know, becoming more and more prolific every year. So we highlight those uh, the universal design and clothing and fashion it's um, it's not a show that's about fixing people at all. It's really just giving people with disabilities a style a platform, and um, yeah, it's we're we're about to start filming season two. In oh, that's January. fantastic! I will month. definitely yeah. check that out. Yeah. All right, cool. I'll, th- I'll watch it because honestly, like I love wearing uh, some nice suits, but every time, like it doesn't matter. Like whenever the pictures come out, everything's all scrunched up because getting sitting in the wheelchair, just so much scrunch. And so I So I mean this is we we address this, right? We have Izzy Camilleri who understands that seated body types, uh, clothing fits differently. And so there are brands now that do cater to wheelchair users where the cut is different and the waistline is higher. So we, we taught, we get into it's all that thorough. stuff. Yeah. So oh, um, man. there's, that yeah, it's bad. really, maybe I just got yeah. to move to Toronto or something. Hollywood North. Yeah. Maybe we'll just have to I do mean, that. Come to Holly, Canada. Come Hollywood North. Yeah. Right? right. Hollywood North. Yeah. All right. Zach Enner's book. Yep. Zach Enner's book is called if at birth, you don't succeed. Happy New Year, Trippers. I hope you spend a little time today thinking about one thing, at least, that you already love about yourself. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks for listening to Tripping On Air. Don't forget to visit us at trippingonair.com.